So my name's Nick Birch. I'm CTO and Head of AI Development at Quanticate, which is a firm that helps out with clinical trials. We've got a lot of mathematicians and statisticians doing analysis. Um, I'm going to show some source code in the slides during the talk. I've only put in little snippets that are relevant, but I have the whole thing available as an IPython notebook, so you can have a look at more of the context now if you'd like, and then also later you can clone that notebook and try and customize it for your own needs. So, nice little QR code, hopefully going to work for everyone. Okay, so it's not going to be your typical AI talk. I'm going to explain a little bit about the kind of problem that I've got to solve, and then we're going to look at how we can do AI for text, how we can make it better, and then at the very end I'm going to give a whole bunch of resources so that if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's the sort of problem that you've got, you'll have some pointers on how to go off and learn some more. So, what is AI and ML, and why is it the buzzword at Burn and Buzzwords this year? So, um, AI, artificial intelligence, ML, machine learning. Um, Larry Tesla's theorem is that AI is whatever hasn't been done yet, and ML is whatever we can do today. Some other people say that if you're raising VC funds, it's AI. If you're hiring staff, it's ML. Okay, but why today? So the first big AI bubble was in the mid-1980s, and there was over a billion US dollars raised in VC funding that was mostly AI for expert systems. They had two big problems. One of them is there wasn't enough training data available to build their AIs, to train their AIs. And the second problem was that in the 1980s, it was cheaper to employ an expert than it was to buy the computers. We're back again today. So Moore's Law to the rescue. One million US dollars worth of computing power in 1985 is less than a dollar today. What's more, Amazon will rent you a machine with a whole terabyte of memory for about the cost of a latte an hour. Okay, you can rent from them a four terabyte memory machine for 25 bucks an hour. So a whole bunch of problems that used to need more computers than would fit in this room are now 25 bucks an hour. Okay, that's the first thing. And then we've got a lot more data available to train our models on. Whereas you used to have a few records, we've now got terabytes and petabytes of records that we can train on. And the other big thing is all the open source libraries and frameworks. You used to have to hire computer scientists to write your, open, to write your AI library so that you could then get your data scientist to train it. It's just three lines of Python now, five lines of Java. It's amazing. There's all these libraries out there that make it easy so you can focus on the data and on your model, not on how the hell do I build one of these things. Okay machine learning. XKCD, everyone seen this one before? Be aware that some of it is just cheating with your hyperparameters until the right answer comes out. <laughs> uh, you can do amazing things with AI and ML, and you can also do terrible, terrible things. Just try and have some quality metrics that give you an idea of what's going on. Okay, so in your typical AI and ML demo, you have images. Images are cool and make for good demos. So, let's do a little bit of audience participation, labeling some data. Is this um, dogs or cats? Dogs, okay. What about this one, is it dogs or cats? Ah, oh. okay. So the AI is only gonna be as good as the questions and the training data. So if you give an AI that's trained to recognize dogs and cats a picture of a koala, it's not going to give you the right answer. OK, let's generalize. What kind of animal is this one? Kangaroo. OK. This one? This is a wombat. OK. But if you're not careful, your AI will say that's a dog because, you know, four legs low to the ground. And this one? No, this one is an echidna. <laughs> so if you're Getting a load of humans to classify your images and they don't know what's in the image, they can't give you the training data that your AI is going to need. So, image classification is pretty cool as long as your humans are able to give you the right training data. Um, but my data doesn't look like that. I mean, cool as Australian animals are, they, they, they don't represent what I've got at work. What I've got at work is stuff like this. 
Anyone recognizing these kind of things? You've got a lot of these at work. You've got spreadsheets, you've got Word documents, you've got lots and lots of data, you've got um, Q&A, all that kind of thing. So this is the kind of stuff that I've got a lot of, and I'm hoping that most of you also have a lot of. And saying, is this a cat or a dog or a wombat? It's not really going to cut it. So now, if you did want image classification, there was a really good one last year on satellite imagery. And if you really wanted one that's just on the numeric model, fitting, uh, numeric model fitting, there was one two years ago where they went through all of it. And again, they've got the code. So if that was your sort of thing, Berlin Buzzwords has covered you before. But what we're interested in today is text. So I have lots and lots of documents. I've got policies, I've got procedures, I've got training guides, I've got help information, I've got RFPs and all that sort of thing. I also have a whole load of people's medical data, trial data, but for ethical and compliance reasons, I'm not allowed to touch that. I have to get ethics committee approval and so on. So I'm not going to touch on any of the work um, medical data stuff. I'm only looking at the, the text that we've got. But I think a lot of us do have lots and lots of text out there. So I need to do a whole load of inexact searching over these documents. So for example, I've got a whole bunch of project training and help stuff. And I've got someone who's new to the project. And they come in. And they're like, OK, so I need to do this thing. Here's the general term. And they look in the training manual, and it uses the project-specific naming. Um, we've got a lot of abbreviations in our company. We've got a lot of weird naming that we use. I think a lot of you also have that. The size of your company goes up. The number of abbreviations and weird thesauruses kind of goes up. So at the moment, our workaround is that people new to the project just message their team lead and say, hey, how do I do this? There's some definite scaling problems with that. Another problem, uh, we're a kind of consulting firm. We deal with lots of big customers, and they keep sending us questionnaires. And those questionnaires come in in the format of the customer, not in our format. And they all use different wording to describe the same thing. So at the moment, lots of really busy people have to keep re-entering the same answers into the RFP questionnaires, even though they answered it three weeks before, because the different companies use different naming. And the sales guys don't understand fully what we do, so they can't do the inexact matching. So can we, can we do something? Now, I can't share with you all of my training material, and I can't share with you all of the RFP responses. If you want an RFP response from us, you've got to come and contract with us. But what I do have is all of the Berlin buzzword talks. So we've got titles, and we've got abstracts, and we've got classifications. So let's see if we can use these as a proxy for doing some text and some matching. OK, you've all been on the website. You've all seen things like this. So we've got speaker, we've got the um, track, we've got the abstract, all sorts of text here. So what we're going to try and do is partly clustering. So what kind of talks are similar to what other kind of talks? What words in those talks are similar to what other words in those talks? And partly, it's going to be a recommendation problem. So if you went to one talk and you're interested in search, then what other talks are you going to be interested in? But it's not exact matching. I don't have classification labels. Um, I didn't go around last year pigeonholing every single person and saying, which talks did you go to and which exact keywords did they match? I haven't got that. And it does have to cope with people who give funny talk titles and cool talk titles, which sometimes, I must admit, is myself. Um, so we've got to deal with inexact matching here. But that maps onto my problems at work, where people use weird naming and weird abbreviations, and people don't know those. So first issue, my AI ML frameworks don't like Word documents, and they don't like spreadsheets. Luckily, Apache Tika is a project that hides all of that complexity. It's in Java. You feed it a thing. You're like, I don't know what this is. Figure it out. And it gives you back some nice, clean HTML that we can then process. So at work, that's what we do. We feed in all of our spreadsheets, all of our policy Word documents, outcomes, HTML. We chunk it up based on the, the slides or the tables. And then we turn that into JSON. Um, I could cheat for this talk, so I just used Beautiful Soup, scraped the whole of the Berlin Buzzwords website, and spat out a load of simple JSON. So level, track, abstract, title, URL, all nice and easy. So taking all the Berlin Buzzword talks, put it in JSON, are we, are we set? No. 
just as the ML frameworks don't work with spreadsheets, they also don't work with JSON of text. So what do we need? Well, what we mostly need is values between minus zero, so minus one and plus one, or zero and one. And we need one value for each feature of the thing that we're going to learn on. It could be a really sparse one with a handful of non-zero values, or it could be a really dense one where almost everything's set. We can have loads of features, but that means we need loads more memory and a bit more CPU. But what we've got is text. Does that look like a bunch of ones and zeros? I mean, yeah, we could turn that into the ASCII hex codes and get a load of ones and zeros, but that's probably not going to be the best feature representation. So a few wording things. So features are the input variables. So one specific aspect of the thing that we're trying to predict. You know, it could be someone's height, it could be someone's weight, it could be the first RGB channel in an image. So the we're going to feed in multiple features to our model. And a lot of the work goes on to selecting what is the right feature. Now, a label is a single value that all of those features represent. So if we feed in all the image data, all the different RGB channels, those are our features, and the label, it should say, this is a dog, this is a cat. Or we might feed in a whole bunch of information about a house and say, this is where it is, this is how many bedrooms it's got, this is what color it's painted, and I want you to predict that this is how much the house is worth. Okay, Training is the process by which we stuff a load of features into a model, and it builds a model. And then inference is where we stuff a load of brand new features in, and it gives us an answer. If that's all new to you, um, have a look at the Google uh, crash course. They've got some bit more detail in there. Um, so a little bit more regression is all about predicting continuous values. Here's the location, number of bedrooms. Give me an answer between 1 and 2 million for how much this house is worth. Classification is for discrete values. Here's an image, dog, cat, wombat. Give me a, one specific answer. And then clustering is where you're not actually sure what goes together. So you're like, here's a load of images. Kind of figure out which ones are like each other and stuff them together, please. So that's unsupervised machine learning. OK, so we've got our text. And we need a load of ones and zeros. So the first thing that we have to do is tokenization. So we're going to turn all of those sentences, all of those paragraphs, down into the little chunks. And the very simple way to do that is just split on white space and punctuation. Uh, if that's new to you, any kind of Lucene intro talk will, will help you there. But we're going to take it and split it down into individual words. OK, now we're going to build a term dictionary. So for each individual term that we've broken up each token, we're going to give it an index. So basically a giant list dictionary lookup. So we've got mouse ran up the clock, nice and easy. That's the first one, so one, two, three, four, five. And then the mouse ran down. So that's the one, mouse, two, ran, three, down, six. So we've got from our text to a load of term indexes. We're getting there. It's not still ones and zeros, but, but we've got some numbers. So unique index, unique ID for each term, and then figure out which terms go where. Now, the trick is to invert that. So the two main ways out there are one-hot encoding, where everything is either one or zero, or continuous bag of words, so the number of times that each word occurs. So in the first sentence here, the mouse ran up the clock. The occurs twice. So for the term for the, it's going to be a two. Um, and then everything else is one or zero. So almost there. And then our final trick is TFIDF. So if a document is going to contain a term a lot, so if a document keeps using the word cat, then probably when someone's searching for cat, we want the document with cat in a lot to come up. Um, if we've got a sort of phrase query, and we are looking for the black cat, and almost every document we have contains the word the, then that's probably not that relevant to our query. But if almost no documents contain the word cat, then that's probably going to be the most important bit in our query. So we want to boost the terms that are rare and push down the terms that are quite common. Okay. And then if our document is really, really long, it's going to have loads of words in it. 
So it's not going to be quite as relevant as a really short document because the terms are going to be more important in that. So we want to weight the rarer terms higher, the common terms lower. We want to weight the longer documents lower, the shorter documents higher. And TFIDF is the simplest way to do this, and it is the one that is most commonly implemented in all of the libraries that you'll be working with. It's not the best, so BM25 is another one. There have been a few more talks at Berlin Buzzwords as well in the past about better ways of doing it. But it has the advantage of being relatively simple, and whatever language, whatever framework you are trying to play with, it's going to be there. So you don't actually have to worry about the maths behind this, the implementation details behind this. You can just say, import TFIDF, require TFIDF, and it's just going to be there. It's going to be implemented. It's going to be unit tested, and we, we don't have to worry too much on the details. And what's going to happen is we're going to feed it a load of text. It's going to tokenize it for us. It's going to build the term dictionary. It's going to calculate the scores, and we're going to get back values between 0 and 1. 0, that term does not occur. 1, that term is really important in that document. So we've got our 1s and zeros. So we're looking good. But my next challenge is that I don't actually know what the right answer is. I haven't gone around to all of you and asked you which talks you wanted to see and which search terms you were looking for. I haven't managed to go around all the new starters on my project at work and ask them what they were trying to find and see what they uh, needed. You can feed that in later, but right at the moment, I don't know the right answer. Um, so I can't do a simple classification. I can't train the model and say, here is my query, here is the talk that you should match, because I don't know it. So I have to do a little bit of fuzziness. So what we're going to start with is just simple text similarity, the same kind of way that it works in Lucene, in Solar, and Elastic. We're going to say, look for terms that are similar to other terms and match based on that. So, first little bit of AI. We're going to build a classification model for our talks, and we're going to feed in the title and the abstract, chuck it through a TFIDF. Then we're going to ask our model to classify our query, cluster it, and say which talk is most like our query. And then finally, we're going to do a matching around and say, just based on simple text similarity, which other talks are like that. In code, it looks like this. So build up our TFIDF vector, find out how many things are in it. So in this case, I've got 294 talks, and it came out as 30,000 different terms. I'm going to calculate the similarity between each talk and each other talk. I'm going to use a multinomial naive Bayes, a really simple um, but quite powerful AI framework, and I'm going to learn and build a model. So this probably would have taken in the 1980s a man year or two to do, and we've done it in less than 10 lines of Python. It is wonderful living in the future. Um, this is all done with scikit-learn, which is a Python library for machine learning. Other libraries exist, other languages exist. Pretty much whatever you're going to want to do it in, it's going to be available. The reason that we're picking scikit-learn here is that we're optimizing for developer productivity. It's a bit slower than TensorFlow, but it's really easy to follow, and it's really easy for me to train my new data scientists in how it works. Whereas TensorFlow, super fast, but you've got to have a lot of knowledge to start before all the documentation makes sense. So I'd say if you're new to all this, pick something simple. Later on, when your model's got a lot bigger, you've got a lot more complexity, then go down one of the super fast routes. But trying to learn machine learning and TensorFlow at the same time is a bit more of a challenge. And especially if you're not just doing cat or hot dog. So yeah, here's our code. And then finally, to do a query, we feed in some text. We ask the model to predict the talk most like it. Then we um, figure out which, uh, what the score is, so what the similarity is between each talk, sort it by their similarity to the talk that our model has suggested, and then print those out. Not the best way, but surprisingly effective. So let's try a live demo. This is hopefully going to work. So here is the IPython notebook that we were having a look at earlier. And we've built up our model already. Let me try and make that text a bit bigger for you. So as you see, it's the same kind of code that I've just shown on the screen before. 
And then, would someone like to suggest a talk title or a query or something for us to work on? Someone near the front, maybe. Come on. Okay. Let's try. Um, no, I don't think it actually took that live demo. Oh, no, I sometimes get this wrong. Right, so here we are. Here are some of the talks that it's recommended for machine learning. And it's not that great, actually. <laughs> it's OK, but it's not amazing. So what can we do? So the next thing we can try is clustering. So with clustering is where we want the machine learning system to figure out what is similar to other things without the help of a label. If we've got the label, that's classification. That's dog, that's a hot dog, easy. Clustering is where we don't quite know up front what the right answer should be. Um, so the best one to start with is usually k-means. So it comes from signal processing. So we're going to group n things into k groups, and we're going to do that in a way where we're trying to minimize the error. So how many clusters? So um, if we've got 294 talks and we make 294 clusters, we've got zero error. Every talk is in its own cluster. It's not really actually helped us with the grouping, though. If we have one single cluster and put everything in together, then we're going to have the maximum error. And again, we haven't really got anything useful. So we sort of need something in between the two, where most things are grouped with other things like them, and the error's fairly low. Um, if you know what your labels are, there's a whole bunch of techniques you can use for figuring out which cluster size is best for you. But I haven't got that, because I don't actually know the right answer. So. The main two we've got available are average silhouette and gap statistic measures, which try and give us an idea of how effective things are fitting in our cluster. Um, now, the next problem with k-means is it's not completely deterministic. It sort of wanders down the graph until it finds a nice low point and stops. Now, it might have wandered a little way down and found a little bump and got stuck in a sort of ditch halfway down the hill, or it might make it all the way to the bottom. So we have to run it a whole bunch of different times, starting in different places, and then take the lowest point that it's reached. So this is the next thing to know about your machine learning journey is it's not always going to give you the same answer each time you run it, and you have to run it a bunch of times to be sure that you've got the best answer possible. When you had your nice, simple linear program that was going to do some filtering and then give you an answer, you ran it once, there's the answer. You run it again, there's the same answer. Machine learning doesn't always work like that. If you have exactly the same seed each time, and you're not using the randomness, and you're using the same size steps, you should be able to get the same answer each time. But if you're picking a different random seed each time you run it, maybe picking different parameters, you could get a different answer out on the same input data using the same code just based on these random seeds. That could mean that the next time you run it, it gets better, or it might get worse. If you care about that, make a note of the seed, and when you save the model, save all the seeds and the parameters that were used to build it, so you can recreate it. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you build this amazing recommender model, and then your boss comes to you and says, oh, that's wonderful, so now we've got a little bit more data, can we add that in? And you go, mm, no. <laughs> your model's probably not going to be stuck in time, so make sure that you've captured everything that went into building it, which is not just the data, not just the feature extraction. It's also all of the hyperparameters that you fed in, like the number of steps and the random seeds so that you can recreate it. So we're going to have to run our k-means clustering a few times at each point, and then try and see which size cluster is going to work best. So in code, we're going to have a, a range of cluster sizes that we're going to try. And for each one, we're going to build a clustering, um, and then we're going to take the silhouette score to try and figure out roughly how accurate it is, and then at the end we're going to sort and figure out which one was best. So we run that, and it's a lot slower than the naive Bayes, and we end up with something like this. So as you see, start off with only a few clusters, the accuracy is not that great. If we end up 
up in the top right, we've got a lot more clusters, but then we've got actually less grouping together. Each cluster has fewer things in, and the score's going up. But as we move up, there's local maxima and minima. It's not just a nice, smooth, straight line. Some cluster sizes are better than others, just based on our input data. So we're going to look at this and say, right, well, we want about 50 clusters. Based on finger-in-the-air guess, we think that's about as many as going to be the ideal, so about six talks in each cluster. So then we're looking for somewhere around the 50 mark where we've got a nice high value, and then we'll take that as the, the best one to go for. But again, there's not a single simple answer. You're going to have to start dealing with uncertainty, dealing with errors, dealing with things that don't move in a nice smooth fashion. And you're going to have to get comfortable with it, which for a lot of us used to, nice deterministic programs is a bit, bit of a change. OK. So we had a 20 to 30,000 different dimensions, to different terms, and we're going to bring that down to about 50, 50 clusters. Now, how do we see how that works? On the whole, our brains like about a maximum of three or four dimensions. So you can have a 3D plot, 3D different axis, and then have different colors, and that is about the limit that you can really cope with, and even that's advanced. Um, Two to three dimensions is about all we can cope with. But we started off with 30,000, and we've just reduced it down to 50. We're not going to be able to get a nice, pretty graph that we can look at and say, yes, that one's awesome, that one's worse. We're going to have to throw away some more information. Um, so techniques like ts &E and PCA let you do that, throw away a whole bunch of the dimensions while keeping some of the information, some of the relationships, but not all. Just be aware that you might build a model, feed it into a TSNE, look at it, and say, oh, that's beautiful, we're all set. But because it smushed all the different dimensions down, that might not mean it's perfect. Equally, if it looks terrible in TSNE, it might still be a good model. These are kind of rough visual guides for us, but they're not perfect answers. So this is a TSNE plot, and things are reasonably spaced out. So that's probably quite good. If everything was really close together, then it wouldn't actually have done much clustering. The fact that it's managed to group the different talks into different separate clusters seems to give us an idea that it's, it's worked OK and it's, it's grouped things together. But I've got 50 dimensions, and I've just squished them into two on the page, so I can't be certain. So the only thing really to do is to test it. Now, this was our raw data. So this is the 50, 000, uh, sorry, 30,000 different dimensions. And then I've just plotted it in two dimensions. And then the color is the cluster that it put things in. Um, now, the trouble is I've got 50 different clusters. And um, most of you are a long way from the screen. Um, it's a bit hard to tell the different colors, how well that's worked, because I've got 15 different yellows. I've got 15 different blues. So, Again, you can have lovely, pretty graphs, but they don't necessarily help you in telling whether or not this has worked. If you can, get nice, clean training data, get your humans out there to go and classify things, give you proper answers, and do proper statistics. Trying to look at this and be like, is that OK? Mm, maybe. So um, our next AI approach is to um, Identify the optimal cluster size, which in this case seemed to be 51. Build the k-means clustering at that size. Match the text of our query into a cluster. Find the center of that cluster, and then do regular sort of Lucene-style text similarity matching from there. Um, here's the code. So with the k-means clustering, it's going to group the talks together, and then it's going to tell us the center of that cluster. And that center is going to be in the TFIDF space. So it's going to be a virtual talk that is the middle of all of the other talks in the cluster. So we're going to match onto that and work from there. So does it work? I'll get you to shout out some more query terms, and we'll see if it's any better. So who wants to suggest a query? Machine learning? 
Let's run it. Okay, so here we are. So these are what it thinks are the best talks in machine learning. How to start a company based on machine learning. Okay, that one seems okay. What makes machine learning algorithms work? Data preparation, business intelligence. Yeah, I think that one's worked okay. We've got, we've got some reasonable things. And some of these don't actually contain the word, the exact words machine learning. So that's also quite good because we want to do similar-ish things. And if you want to have a play, the, the, the notebook is there. You can type in your very worst queries at a later date. Have a play around, play around with the k-mean size, and, and see how it does. OK, so the next kind of question is, we've got the talk years. We know which year each of the Berlin Buzzword talks are from. Equally, on my RFP responses, I know which year we gave those answers to a customer. Um, for my training material, I know which year that training was given in. So what, what if I want to include that? Now, we can't easily add it as a feature, because when we're doing the query, we don't have a year. Like, the talk has a year. The query doesn't. Um, if we add it at scoring time, um, that's a bit harder because we're not scoring the query. We're finding a similar talk to a query and then scoring based on that. So if we would actually had Lucene, we could do better because uh, of the way it's working. Um, so ideally, we want to feed it into the model before we do the scoring, not after. But if we reduce the TF-IDF weights by some factor based on the year, we're changing where in the dimensional space they are, and we might actually end up pushing talks into the wrong cluster just by reducing the boosts. So it's not actually as easy as we'd hoped for. Our next problem is that our data isn't long-term static. All being well, there's going to be Berlin Buzzwords 11 next year, and we're going to be then adding in additional talks. Um, likewise, um, my training people at work are still writing new training, and they keep feeding that in. So we're going to have to keep rebuilding our model. Now, let's say I was to force all of you to stay in the room, not go to lunch, get out a copy of the current program, and scribble down what queries you'd have given for each of the talks in the program. You'd probably hate me for that, but we could get that data. And then you'll come back in a year's time, and it's not pre-classified because we've added new talks in and we haven't got the classification. So how do we, even if we know the right answer for the query today, how do we find out what the answer is for tomorrow? So we're going to need to factor in some sort of known correct versus brand new data and make sure that the ML isn't prioritizing too much the well-known existing data at the expense of brand new data, so the novelty factor, which I don't actually have a good answer for right now, but I'm just saying, if you're thinking about your data and building your models, think about what happens when brand new data gets fed in. OK, a little bit more on the tokenization. Um, stop words, if you've come from a Lucene Elastic background, you know all about this. But if there's some very common words like the, a, they, those kind of words that crop up loads, we want to throw them away, because that's going to shrink the size of our TF-IDF matrix. The smaller the size of the matrix, the less memory we need, and the faster our calculations are going to run. But be aware that you need to have the right stop words, firstly for your language, and secondly for the domain of your text. It's no good taking one that is trained on Wikipedia movie titles and then feeding it into a load of data that's talking about clinical trial processing. It's not necessarily going to work so well. Next thing, stemming. If we've got a whole bunch of different forms of a word, like talk, talks, talks, talking. They all represent the same thing. So if we've got a language model, we can trim all those back to the same word, and then we can do an exact match on Nick is talking when we query for talked. Um, another interesting trick is engrams. So if we're doing word-based engrams, we can just take every word as a single thing. So that's word unigrams. Or we can do... Um, word bigrams. So if we say Nick is talking, then we've got Nick is and is talking. Those are our two bigrams. So that lets us do poor man's phrase query. It's important because we haven't got a lovely query parser like in Lucene. Uh, if we're doing stuff on characters, 
then we could have trigrams. So the trigrams of hello are H-E-L, E-L-L, L-L-O. So if someone has made a typo, then the use of these um, trigrams might allow us to do a correction on their typo. But you do lose some of the information about where those three letters come in the word, and you might end up matching um, just on some common pattern like um, IST, that crops up in all sorts of places in English language words. So you might say, oh, well, we're looking for something that has the trigram IST, and you've got a whole load of completely irrelevant words coming through. So there's some trade-offs we made here. Final thing, whatever you do has to be the same for query and model building. If you have different stop words, if you've got different tokenization, different stemming, then your query won't match anymore, and you won't get sensible answers. Okay, next thing to be aware of is feature extraction and embeddings. So even from just 300 talks, we had 30,000 terms come out. And in the TF-IDF matrix, most of the values were zero. So it's a sparse matrix. It's going to take up a reasonable amount of memory. Um, if we're working with Bayesian and k-means, they're okay with 30,000 terms. They can cope. Run reasonably fast, they, they don't mind. Um, neural networks... Not so much. Neural networks like 50, maybe 100 inputs total. Yeah, we can use stop words, we can use stemming. That might get us down from 30,000 to 20,000, but that's still a lot more than 50. So if we want to move on to using neural networks, we need to think about ways to reduce the dimensionality. Now, we've already seen a little bit of that with the TSNE, where just so that our eyes could cope with it, we reduced the dimensionality down to two. But our neural networks are going to need the reduction there. Um, so if this is all new to you, um, scikit-learn have got a great piece on it, and then Google have a good piece on it as well. But the, um, the way of turning our raw features into a much smaller set for a neural network is generally known as embedding. Um, right. Okay, one of the most popular ways of doing the embedding in text is word to vec It was originally developed by Google, um, it is actually based on a neural network itself, but you tend to use it to pre-process your data before you give it to your own neural network. And if you give it enough text, it can make predictions um, based on a word's meaning. So if you say, um, figure out the vector between man and boy, okay, now find the point in the embedding for woman, apply the same vector distance and see what word we get to, and then you get a girl if you trained it right. Unfortunately, there's this thing called bias, where if you fed it a lot of human-written text, and you might say, man is to this job and woman is to, and you get a sexist answer out. Because if you fed in sexist training data, which actually is most of the training data out there because most of us have our biases when we're writing language, then you can end up training a biased AI. But assuming that you've got the right kind of thing, you get lovely things like this, where it's figured out the relationships between a whole bunch of words and how they interact with each other, and done it in a vector space, so that when we feed that into the neural network and we train and we do queries, it can figure out some parts of speech, figure out some parts of relationships, and give us good answers. So it's worth having a play with word to vec if you want to do anything around this. Um, there's a whole bunch of implementations of it available, and Google have got quite a good intro to it. Okay, neural networks. Who here has come across neural networks? A little bit of audience participation before you fall asleep. Okay, so the system is built up of a whole bunch of layers. You have an input layer where you're feeding your features in, an output layer which is where you want to get your answer out, and then a bunch of hidden layers in between that the system has figured out what they should be. So you go to the neural network system and you say, this is my input, that's the prediction I want you to make. You figure out how to glue all of these different bits together for me, and then away we go. Um, the more layers you have, potentially the better answer you're going to get, but the more work that's going to go on in the training. Um, the more inputs and outputs you have, again, the more work that it has to do in figuring out the right layer. Um, think about what kind of outputs you're going to want. Um, 
If you need something that's going to be a cat or a dog, you need to constrain your outputs so that the probability of cat or dog adds up to 100. If you say, tell me roughly what's in this image, then something that comes back and says 80% chance of dog, 70% chance of cat, that's probably okay. But if what you really wanted to know is, is this the right talk, you want uh, a single answer. The more layers you put in, the longer it's going to take to train. And this is an iterative process. You keep running it, suggesting that it adds some extra layers in, or adds some extra neurons in, or throw away some neurons, and then you reevaluate the score. And you keep going until the score basically doesn't change. OK, now, if we know what the model should be predicting, then um, we can train and we can evaluate the model. Um, let's say we've got our 300 talks and we've got a load of answers. Now, if we train the model on all of that input data, we have no way of knowing how well it's done, because we've got nothing left to test with. If we train it on three pieces of input data and keep 3,000 back to test with, we can be really sure how well it's done, but it's not going to have learnt much. So we're going to have to have this trade-off of our input data, which is nicely labelled, into the training part and the testing part. Um, if we give the model too much data, then it can overfit, and it can learn specific attributes of our test data that's not present in the rest of our real data. Um, another thing to look at is if you've not got that much data, you can split, shuffle it all up, do a split for test and train, get an answer, shuffle it around again, do the same, test and train, and make sure that you're getting roughly the same kind of accuracy each time. That gives you an idea that your model is fairly stable, and it's not doing too much overfitting. So that's cross-validation. Hyperparameters. A hyperparameter is anything that we're tuning or selecting and changing in the machine learning that's not part of the data and the features. So for our k-means example, one of the hyperparameters was the number of clusters that we're breaking it down into. Um, quite often, it's going to be the seeds, the steps, the number of layers, um, how much to change between iterations, all those kind of things. If you pick the wrong parameters, your machine learning will get stuck like halfway down the hill in a little little bump. Um, yeah, it might just take forever to complete. So the hard bits in machine learning tend to be picking the appropriate features and picking the appropriate hyperparameters. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of experimentation. Um, Google did a study last year on the hyperparameter picking, and they said, it is cheaper to have a data scientist in California picking hyperparameters than to have a whole extra set of machine learning trying to optimize the hyperparameters of another machine learning. But that was a year ago, and probably in California now, it's better to have an AI tuning your extra AIs. But anywhere else in the world, probably you're better off with humans. Maybe in five years, that'll have changed again. But for now, we have to have the humans looking at it and saying, oh, I think I'm going to want roughly this kind of many steps based on my past experience, and then my AI should converge on the answer quite quickly. OK, need to think about errors. Um, if we've got something that's supposed to say cancer, not cancer, and we feed it the, um, the, uh, the diagnoses and the uh, health records of a person, um, it could say they have cancer, and they do, so that's a true positive. It could say they're clear from cancer, and they don't. That's a true negative. Or it could say, nope, they're all clear, no cancer, and they've really got it. So that's the false negative. Or it might say to someone who's clear that they've got cancer, so that's uh, a false positive. Now, if you're detecting cancer, what happens if we give someone the all clear that's actually got a tumour? Or what happens to someone who doesn't have a tumour and we've just given them a load of chemotherapy? So you've got to think about the impact of your model and the impact on the errors of your model. Other things to think about is the precision, the recall, and the confidence. So the precision is how much correct results, correct values in our results. The recall is how many of the correct results we actually gave to you. So if we said, here are five answers, and four of them were correct, then that's an 80%. If we gave you five answers and there were actually a million possible answers, then maybe our recall's pretty terrible. A lot of the models can tell us how sure they are that they've given you the right answer. So that's the confidence. So it might say, I think this is a dog, but I'm only 5% sure. And you say, oh, well, maybe we won't trust that. But equally, it says, that's definitely a dog, 99% accuracy, 99% confidence. You say, okay, well, it's probably okay. 
Okay, already mentioned biases a little bit. Your data sets are probably going to be biased. Um, certainly if you're working with text written by humans, it's definitely going to be biased. Your AI can find extra features. So you might say, oh, I'm a bit worried about the bias in um, my input data, so I'm going to hide gender. But I'm going to leave in the name of the author. And your AI will be like, oh, I'm going to learn what female names look like. Equally, you say, oh, I'm a bit worried about the racism inherent in my data, so I'm going to leave out the race field. But you've left in the postal code or zip code or the first elementary school. And it turns out in your city, people of different races tend to live in different places. Or your AI has just learned that, just figured out the race, even though you didn't give it to it. So think about the bias. Think about how people are going to use your data, how you're going to use the model, and make sure that you correct for it or make them aware of it. And don't reuse the model. There was a really good intro yesterday. It'll be up on YouTube very soon about the bias in text and the ways to correct for that. OK. Um, natural language processing. I'll skip over that. We haven't really got time, but the slides will be up. Uh, Dr. QA, there was a really good talk yesterday on this. Um, it's a thing developed by Facebook for pulling out specific answers from text trained on Wikipedia. Looks really interesting. Haven't played with it yet. Only heard of it yesterday, but that looks good. Final question, would Lucene have done better? Probably. For my specific case, probably a fully tuned Lucene elastic cluster, something like that, would have done better. It certainly would have had um, better abilities to scale up to really, really large data sets. Almost all the ML techniques need everything in memory. Lucene doesn't. But as a way to teach a lot of my statisticians about AI and ML, using the kind of data that they understand, and as a way to put some of the AI and ML stuff into production in my company, it was wonderful. So it was worth doing, just not worth doing as a pure search project. So if you're looking for a way to learn AI and you've got text, this is really great. If you think this is going to replace Elasticsearch, it's probably not. OK. Um, both Microsoft and, Azure and Google let you have a play with all of this stuff, batteries included. There's some links there. And the slides will be up on the website soon, but I've got a whole bunch of resources in here if you want to learn some more. OK. Everyone who's hungry, run away now. Anyone who wants to ask me questions, we can do and eat until our lunch break. OK, thanks. Thank you.